and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we're continuing with The Incarnation of Ahriman by Rudolf Steiner, Section 9-5, picking up in Lecture 2. If we ask who stirs up nations against each other, who raises issues that control and direct humanity today? The answer is Ariman and the Arimanic deception which plays into human life. And in this sphere, people very easily succumb to deception. They are not willing to descend to the lower strata where reality is to be found, for you see Ariman skillfully prepares his goal beforehand. Ever since the Reformation and the Renaissance, the economist has been emerging in modern civilization as the representative governing type. That is an actual historical fact. If you go back to ancient times, even to those that I describe today as Luciferic, who were the governing types, the initiates? The Egyptian pharaohs, the Babylonian rulers, the Asiatic rulers, they were initiates. Then the priest type emerged as ruler, and really remained so right up to the Reformation and the Renaissance. Since that time, the economists has had the upper hand. Rulers are in fact merely the henchmen and enforcers of the economists. One must not imagine that the rulers of modern times are anything but the economists' agents. And all that has been enshrined as law and justice is, if one scrutinizes it carefully, simply a consequence of thinking dictated by economics. In the 19th century, economics was for the first time replaced by a thinking based on finance and banking. And in the 19th century was created the whole financial system which swamps every other relationship. One must only be able to examine these things and follow them up empirically and practically. Everything I said in the second public lecture here is profoundly true. One could only wish that people would trace all the ramifications of these things. Their fundamental truth would then become apparent. But just because this dominion of the mere token for material goods, i.e. money, has arisen, Ariman has been given another essential means of deceiving mankind. If people do not realize that the legislative state that safeguards human rights and the organism of the spirit must balance and address the economic order established by economists and bankers, then again, through this lack of awareness, Ariman will find an important instrument for preparing his incarnation. His incarnation is undoubtedly coming, and this lack of insight will smooth the way for his triumphant advance. Such means can be used by Ariman to gain hold on a certain type of person. But there's another type, indeed, the two are often combined in one individual, who also from a different direction smooths the path of Ariman's triumphant progress. Now it is a fact that in real life total errors are not so harmful as half or quarter truths. Total errors are soon seen through, whereas half and quarter truths mislead people. They live with them. These partial truths become a part of life and cause the most devastating confusion. There are people today who do not realize the one-sidedness of the Galileo-Copernican world conception, or who at least do not see its illusory character, or are too easy going to scrutinize it. We have just shown how wrong that is. But there are also people today, numberless people, who acknowledge a certain half-truth, a very significant half-truth, and who do not properly scrutinize its purely hypothetical justification. Strange as it may appear to many people, It is just as one-sided to view the world solely through the Gospels and reject any other search for true reality as it is to view the world from the standpoint of Galileo and Copernicus or of materialistic university science in general. The Gospels were given to those who lived in the first centuries of Christianity and to believe that they can instruct as to the whole of Christianity nowadays is simply a half-truth. It is therefore also a half-error which befogs people and thus furnishes Ariman with the best means of attaining the goal and the triumph of his incarnation. Very numerous are those who think they are speaking out of Christian humility, but in reality are appallingly arrogant when they say, Oh, we need no spiritual science. The homeliness, the simplicity of the Gospels gives us all that human beings need of eternal truth. A frightful arrogance is expressed for the most part in this apparent humility which is highly serviceable to Ariman in the sense I have indicated. I explained at the beginning of today's lecture how at the time the Gospels were written, people's thinking, feeling, and views were still permeated by the Luciferic impulse, in that they could understand the Gospels through a certain Luciferic gnosis. But understanding the Gospels in this old sense is not possible today. 
no real understanding of the Christ can be gained if one relies merely on the Gospels, especially in the form in which they have been handed down. Nowhere today does a less true understanding of Christ exist than in the various faiths and confessions. The Gospels must be deepened by spiritual science if we wish to gain an actual grasp of the Christ. It is then interesting to examine the separate Gospels and arrive at their real content. To accept the Gospels as they are and as numberless people accept them today, and particularly as they are taught today, is not a path to Christ. It's a path away from Christ. Hence, the confessions are moving further and further away from Christ. What sort of understanding of Christ does someone develop who will accept the Gospels and nothing else, without a profounder grasp that spiritual science offers? He comes ultimately to a picture of Christ, but that is the utmost he can attain through the Gospels alone. This is not the full reality of Christ, for today only spiritual science can lead to that. What the Gospels lead to is only a kind of hallucination of the Christ, a real inner vision or vision, yet only a picture. The Gospels today provide a mean to form a vision of the Christ, but not to approach the reality of Christ. That is why modern theology has become so materialistic. Theological commentators and expounders of the Gospels have wondered what to make of the Gospels. They decide at length that, in their view, the result is similar to conclusions relating to Paul on the road to Damascus. These theologians, who are supposed to confirm Christianity but who in fact undermine it, say, Paul was simply ill, suffering from nerves, and he had a vision on the road to Damascus. The point is that the Gospels themselves can only lead to hallucinations, to visions, but not to realities. The Gospels do not give us the real Christ, but only a hallucination of the Christ. The real Christ must be sought today through all that can be gained from a spiritual knowledge of the world. The very people who swear by the Gospels alone and reject every kind of real spiritual knowledge form the beginning of a flock which will be susceptible to Ariman when he appears in human shape in modern civilizations. From these circles, from these members of confessions and sects who reject detailed knowledge brought by spiritual endeavor, whole hosts will develop as adherents of Ariman. Now, this is all beginning to develop. It is there, it is at work in modern humanity, and someone who speaks to people today with the knowledge of spiritual science senses and addresses it, no matter whether he is speaking on social or other questions. He knows where the hostile powers lie, that they live supersensibly, and that human beings are their poor, misguided victims, and that humanity's urgent need is to free itself from these things that form such a great temptation and contribute to Ariman's triumphant progress. Many people have felt something of this kind, but there is still a widespread failure of courage to engage with the historical impulses arising from Christ, Lucifer, and Ariman in the urgent way which anthroposophy must insist on. Even those who have no idea of what is necessary stop short. For instance, where does one encounter any knowledge that secular materialistic science with its Ariamonic character must be permeated with the Christ impulse? And that, on the other hand, the Gospels must be illuminated through the explanations of spiritual science. Consider how many people struggle to the point of reality shedding light in either of these directions by means of spiritual scientific knowledge. Yet humanity will only acquire the right attitude to the earthly incarnation of Ariman if it sees through these things and has the courage, will, and energy to illuminate both secular science and the Gospels with spirit. Otherwise, half-truths always result. Think, for example, of how Cardinal Newman, who, after all, was an enlightened man, one who understood modern religious development, openly stated at the time of his investiture as cardinal in Rome that a new revelation was needed if the ca Christian Catholic teaching was to survive. We have no need, however, of a new revelation. The time of revelations in the old sense is over. We need a new science, one that is illumined by the Spirit. But human beings must have the courage for this new science. Think of the Lux Mundi movement that originated with certain eminent theologians, members of the English High Church in the 80s and 90s of the 19th century. It consisted of a series of literary studies imbued throughout with the endeavor to build a bridge from secular science to the contents of religious dogma. One can say that it floundered in hither and thither, never boldly grasped secular science, never illuminated it with the spirit. There was no unprejudiced examination of the Gospels with the knowledge that the Gospels alone are not enough today, that they must be elucidated and illumined. But mankind must be courageous in both directions and say, secular science by itself leads to illusion, the Gospels alone lead to hallucination. The middle way between illusion and hallucination is found only by grasping reality through the spirit. That is the point. We need to grasp such things today. Purely secular science would deliver people up entirely to illusion, and ultimately this would lead to nothing but follies. Quite enough folly is 
perpetrated today already, for surely the World War was a great folly and catastrophe. Yet many people were involved in it who were thoroughly imbued with the ruling secular science of our time. And if you notice what remarkable psychological phenomena arises whenever some sect or other emphasizes one of the four Gospels to the exclusion of the others, then you will more easily understand what I have been saying about the Gospels today. See how strongly inclined to all sorts of hallucinations are sects that pay heed to society to the Gospel of St. John or solely the Gospel of St. Luke. Fortunately, there are four Gospels, which outwardly contradict one another. And this has so far prevented the great harm which such one-sidedness would cause. The fact that we have four Gospels means that we are not drawn too far in the direction of the one, but have the others to balance it. One Gospel is read aloud on one Sunday and another on another Sunday, and so the illusory power of the one is counterbalanced by that of the other. A great wisdom lies in the fact that these four Gospels together have come down to the civilized world. In this way, people are protected from being drawn into one current alone, which takes possession of them as is the case for so many members of sex, through being influenced by one gospel alone. When solely one gospel influences, it is particularly clear how this ultimately leads to hallucination. In fact, it's essential today to give up much of one's subjective inclination, much of what one is attached to and thinks pious or clever. Mankind must, above all, seek universality and the courage to look at things from all sides. I wish to say this to you today so that you may realize that what one tries now to bring about within humanity has truly deeper grounds than just some sort of subjective prejudice. In fact, one can say that it is read from the signs of the times and it must become reality. Thus concludes section 9.5 of the Incarnation of Ariamon. Next week I will read section 9.6. Lecture 3 from Dornock, 1st of November 1919. I will see you then. Along.